Attendees can join. This webinar is being recorded. Welcome everybody as you are coming in. Hi, everybody. Welcome. As you're filing in, it takes a little while for everybody to get from the waiting room into the webinar. So we're just giving folks some time to arrive. Welcome, welcome. All right. Hi, all. Welcome to this borderless sponsored conversation from the University of Iowa Theater Arts and co sponsored with the Pride Alliance Center of the University of Iowa. I am Jen Shook, and I use she, her pronouns, and for accessibility purposes, I'll visually describe myself. Uh, I am wearing burgundy cat eye glasses and uh, burgundy metallic uh, lipstick for the purposes of bringing some some queer femme energy to the to the day. I have shoulder length brown and gray hair pulled back uh, and I'm wearing a, a teal kimono and as many shiny other objects as I could find. I'm sitting in an armchair with a green curtain behind me and a red blanket and there might be a cat at some point. Um, we are honored and um, want to acknowledge that we in the University of Iowa, we are located on the homelands of the Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Abahoche, Kickapoo, Menominee, Miyamaki, Nuitachi, Umaha, Wazache, Chiware, Odawa, Ponca, Bodawadmi, Neshnabe, Meskwaki, Nemahahaki, Sakawaki, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Sanish, Nubega, Nueta, and Ho Chunk nations. And the nations, the Omaha or Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, and the Meskwaki or Sac and Fox of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Ho Chunk or Winnebago tribe of Nebraska nations continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. And we include this acknowledgement of land and sovereignty um, as part of a means of discussing our relational responsibility of which the Borderless series is uh, a part of working through in art, collaborating with and acknowledging the communities around us and thinking intersectionally about how uh, acknowledging and supporting Native faculty, staff, and students um, is directly aligned with supporting queer faculty, staff, and students, and other BIPOC faculty, staff, and students. And we're all meeting today via the seemingly intangible technologies with real infrastructural and ecological impacts, including Zoom, which is headquartered in what is now called San Jose, California which are the traditional lands of the Ohlone, Temian, and Muwekma peoples. And Zoom operates via pieces large and small from enormous buildings of servers of copper to copper wiring, originally designed by Navajo women weavers. I offer that piece of information in the spirit of how we learn and share history, which is the topic of our conversation today, queer history round table, how we teach each other. And um, I want to point to, I will put in the chats, uh, the information about the Borderless series, including upcoming events. Uh, the next one is next Friday, February 18th, uh, FUBU Open Mic in collaboration with Afro House, the Afro-American Cultural Center. That is also going to be awesome. 
as today's conversation is. And um, with that said, uh, I will also just say you should be seeing a gallery view, which means that you see all of the panelists at once. If you are not seeing that, please let me know in the chats. And you should also be seeing the ability to raise your hands, the ability to um, chat either to everyone present listening or just to the hosts and panelists and the ability to um, put a question in the Q&A as well as read each other's questions and upvote questions you particularly like. So um, I am going to be monitoring the chat and I'll be adding, annotating with some links and uh, notes on what we're hearing and you all are welcome to do that as well. If you want to ask a question, you can use any of those functions, uh, chat or q and I will be watching. So feel free at any point to drop in a question or comments um, or favorite thing somebody said that you want to uh, make note of or plus one. And with that, I will hand the mic, as it were, over to our director and playwrights and moderator today, Anne Kreitman. Thank you, Jen. Um, I just want to say hello to everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us here today. I'm really excited about this conversation and the group of folks we have um, to engage in that conversation. Uh, my name is Ann Kreitman. I use she, her uh, pronouns. I am an MFA graduate student in directing for theater here at the University of Iowa. Um, and joining us today on our panel, we have Aidan Bettine, the University of Iowa Community and Student Life archivist residency librarian and also the executive director of the LGBTQ Iowa archives and library. We have Kim Mara, UI professor emeritus in theater arts and American studies. Christopher Rasheem McMillan, assistant professor of dance and gender women's and sexuality studies. And Elizabeth Rodriguez Fielder, assistant professor in the English department. Um, so uh, to start us off uh, and get us all on to the topic. Um, I would love for all of us to go through, or all of our panelists here to um, talk a little bit about your work and how queer history intersects or informs what we do. So Aiden, if you'd like to take it off. All right, hello. I'm, I'm so excited to be here and, and have this, uh, I'm sure, bountiful um, round table today. Um, and, and how queer history intersects with my work. Um, so there's kind of two hats that I show up with. One is certainly running an LGBTQ community archives here in Iowa City um, and founding that and learning about um, the ways that we can share our hyper local and preserve our hyper hyper local uh, LGBTQ history in the state of Iowa. Um, but also in my role as an institutional archivist um, in the university archives here on campus. Um, and I think what I want to start with campus, because uh, I know the queer community archives will come up um, a lot. Um, but I think being a queer and trans archivist, um, queer history informs how I show up for everybody else's history. Um, I think having the experience of knowing the ways that I didn't know queer history when I was younger. I didn't have trans elders to look at um, as a young trans teen trying to find my way in, in coming out um, and figuring out my identity. Um, I know what it's like to feel really invisible um, and to not be seen and to not have stories that are passed through uh, generations. Um, and so I think that kind of lack of queer history when I was younger, I think the landscape has certainly changed and Anne's play is a great evidence to that, um, really has taught me and informed the way that I show up as an archivist for a lot of other people. Um, as the community and student life archivist on campus, um, I collect predominantly around student organization history. Um, but when I look at the university archives at a predominantly white institution, I see that a lot of histories are missing. Um, and a lot of student organizations aren't represented that are black, um, that are disabled, that are indigenous, that are queer. Um, we just don't have the most robust record. We have some, so I wanna give a little credit uh, on that front, but I think being a queer and trans person and recognizing that um, our history is so hard to find um, in archives and so hard to learn from each other. Um, it's really informed the ways that I show up to preserve and who I'm prioritizing in the collection work that I do 
um, as a staff member on campus. Um, so I feel like kind of a queer archival outlook um, informs my daily work where I'm archiving the history of, of many other communities um, and not just the LGBTQ community. So I'll pause there and, and be happy to talk about the community work a little bit later. Thank you, Aiden. Uh, Kim. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to do this. It's great to be here and to be in the conversation with, with these folks. Um, so I am a, a theater and performance historian. And in, in the way that I pursue my, uh, my research and the way that I've taught, I, I always read the past from a feminist queer perspective, meaning uh, that I'm always reading against presumptions of straight white male humanness with an understanding of identities as not essential or fixed, but uh, constructed and contingent. And I ask of the performances that I study in the past, how and why particular constructions of identity and particular power relations are coming into formation in whatever uh, the, the, the play or performance situation is that we're looking at. So, um, uh, for example, in reading canonical plays, which, you know, we, we still teach, uh, it's, it's vital to not um, just presume that the relationships that are being shown in the plays are, uh, represent certain norms. It's always vital to, to trouble uh, how these <laughs> how these constructions are coming about and how very often in the ways that they're being presented, there, there is both uh, a, a dynamic of dominant power and uh, subversive uh, possibilities going on. So those are the those are the, the ways that I've always approached my job of teaching and researching theater history. And it's certainly uh, an intersectional perspective because fundamentally we're looking at bodies in these performances and these bodies are marked in certain ways uh, and these bodies are moving and interacting and changing. I mean, fundamentally changing uh, in, in front of us. Um, uh, my, my current research, things that I've been involved in the last several years have brought animal studies into relationship with, uh, with human histories. And uh, as I'm, I'm fond of saying to my students in my theater history classes, it's not only the theater that connects me to the past, theater of course being many thousands of years old, uh, but also horses. And you know, you think about mechanical power is really just a function of uh, the last, you know, 150 years or so uh, that before that horses provided a great deal of the power and were very present all around where theater was going on. So I've been thinking about that and how um, human relationships with horses uh, triangulate relationships between and among humans and in effect queer those relationships because of how the human bodies needed to interact with these huge, powerful, uh, plentiful animals. So the horses compound the sense of embodiment and uh, these, these shifting, potentially subversive dynamics going on that, uh, that I'm trying to get at. So that's, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Christopher. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here and be with you. Um, I guess I'll start uh, by saying my work is a, a, as a maker um, and as a scholar um, bridges the, the gap between 
performance between scholarship and practice. And so my work is really enriched by the work of, of esteemed scholars like Kimara, um, who very eloquently set up um, a narrative that troubles, when queerness troubles a, a normal readings of text, normal readings of bodies. And so I find myself often attempting to think about the body as an archive or as an archivist practice in and of itself that can produce particular understandings and readings. Um, and that it's not devoid from the other cultural signi signifiers and, signi and signification of anything else. And so um, the dance classroom or the dance laboratory where we practice is a microcosm of the world in which we're living in. And so part of my work is um, to bring forward um, questions that trouble even a sense of white, um, white queerness uh, with questions of people of color critique. Um, and housing that critique in the body, in the material body, um, and less of using theorists to argue, but just what comes from the body, what comes from people's lived experience and their phenomenological way of making space in the world or way of making their way through the world. How do we use those materials, um, those, 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 those testimonies to come forward? Um, I'm a trained theologian, so a lot of <laughs> what I'm working on is thinking about um, America's predisposition and deep love, um, idea, um, idol worship of, to, to use a sort of religious term, of the Bible. And so it's publics where it's intervening, where it's not intervening, how it's being misused or used, um, it being one of the, one of the most devastating texts to queer people in general, um, has to be contended with, um, on its own terms. And so I spent a lot of time working through uh, what the Bible might be saying, or better yet, what people interpreting the Bible might be saying about any given consideration, in particular around sexuality and gender. Um, and for me, though, those all come together, thinking about religion as an embodied practice and thinking about um, performance or dance as embodied practices, they are connected and definitely technologies of the self, and to so to speak. And so I think I will stop here, but I'm so, again, so happy, so excited to be in this conversation and to be invited to the party. Thank you. Um, can't wait to uh, dive into the phrase body is archive. I'm very excited by that. Um, Liz. Hey everyone, um, I'm super excited to be at the party too. Thank you. Uh, I think that I, I'm a scholar of 60s activism. Um, so queer history is, has a really big moment within, within that time period. Although my work really focuses on performance in the, in the civil rights movement. I think, though, um, kind of going back to something that Aiden said about like kind of showing up with with that sense of understanding how one has access to queer history and then how that manifests in one's work. I think, you know, growing up as a queer Latina, right, in a very like Catholic dominant community and everything, like just the kind of creativity I had to do to imagine a new world for myself, uh, that like that focus on that there's so much possibility within creativity has led my scholarship um, throughout. And so when I look at things that are really historical and politically focused or inflected, like something like the civil rights movement or activism, where there could be like a really like sociological approach to it, I want to know what the artists are doing or, or how activists are engaging in performance. And I, I want to like really lean in in my work to how creativity does that world building that's been essential for, um, for queer people understanding their own history. Uh, so that's really kind of how uh, queer history manifests in, in my work um, personally. And again, like, you know, like we've been saying in this panel, there is a sense of like the intersectional approach that also um, lends itself to beautiful confusion <laughs> in, in a lot of uh, my analytical frameworks. And I think I'll leave it at that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, now uh, really anyone can jump in, but I'll throw the next question out there of um, what were your first pathways or exposures that led you to learning queer history? What was your first sort of access points? Um, I have a funny one if we Please. want to start I, I have uh, so there's the two two really big moments um for me, both of which are kind of equally ridiculous. 
One is that my estranged father took me to Disneyland and gave me, he didn't know what to say to me. So he gave me a copy of uh, Carson McCullers, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And while waiting online at Space Mountain, I read The Heart is a Lonely Hunter and just like totally was like, oh my gosh, there's this whole other way of being in the world. And so I came to the conclusion that I must be a Southerner. Uh, I didn't really understand like what that meant. I was too young. I was like nine, right? So I was like, I must actually be from the South and just be living in New York City. Like that was kind of my go-to. Um, and then the, the other way of learning queer history, and this is the young, like I obviously I'm just trying to not be in grad school right now, right? Um, I was through uh, dance roller skating, uh, being a part of the dance roller skating scene and understanding. And this was like a lot of people from the seventies and living in New York city and like dancing on their roller skates in Central Park and really understanding that there's like a depth and breadth and multi-generationality to queerness, right? That it was not something just like of the youth. So those are kind of like my entry moments into understanding like the depth and breadth of queerness. And how embodied is that as well to see the expression free from the from touching the ground on roller skates? Incredible. Right. And it's like the soundtrack is like the disco, <laughs> the disco music, right? Well, I mean, that that's great, Liz. And um uh, you know, for me, um th there's many, but certainly um being a tomboy in the horse stables and and thereby avoiding um sort of heterosexual rites of passage like dance classes and prom and you know all of that um that the stable allowed for uh other other ways of being and obviously the animals were <laughs> you know a, a huge a huge part of that and, you know, my first uh, erotic attractions uh, to members of my own sex happened, um, you know, around the stables. Um, same place, Oscar Wilde and, and many others uh, got into trouble um, as well. But finding, finding those alternative spaces uh, where, where one could try to be differently but it really wasn't until I got to graduate school that I had sort of a clear opportunity to start putting together the, a connection between who I am or who I was becoming and, and the work I wanted to do. Um, so I, I had a very uh, powerful professor in grad school who kept insisting that the writer's personal life had nothing to do with their plays. And this was a very famous scholar of Tennessee Williams. And uh, at the same time that I was coming out and meeting my, my life partner. Uh, and so, you know, that didn't add up for me. Uh, and by the time I got to arriving at a dissertation topic, um, I found this playwright, Clyde Fitch, who um, uh, was the first playwright to make more than a million dollars in American theater history j just from writing plays. But what was really interesting about him for me was um, that he did it, he became so renowned for making plays that staged women and women's fashion. And he, he put on these plays by directing them himself. And there's a lot of testimony from the actresses about how he would impersonate the roles and invite them to copy him. And that, you know, they, many of them said, well, if only Clyde could play all the roles, you know, th this, this would be a really good play. So, um, you know, it turned out that uh, be, because he was so famous and successful, he was mentioned in the theater history books, uh, but it really wasn't interrogated, you know, what, what was going on with him. Um, so in the course of digging for my dissertation, I learned that, uh, you know, he, um, at the all-male Amherst College, where he went as a young student, he would take every opportunity to play female roles and hold teas for faculty wives. 
And when Oscar Wilde was on his tour of the United States, you know, Clyde took a bunch of his friends and they went down to, to New York uh, to hear Wilde speak. And, um, and then it turned out that Fitch actually had a personal relationship with Oscar Wilde. Uh, I was contacted um, by a Wilde scholar who came across some letters uh, that Fitch and Wilde had exchanged that were quite explicit. So that just kind of cracked open a whole story about Fitch and queer desire and what to do with it when you can't be open about who you are. But it, it, it absolutely was rooted to who Fitch was and who he became as an artist. So that whole journey I went on with him was in some ways an answer to that professor who kept insisting, oh, Tennessee Williams' personal life had nothing to do <laughs> with what was happening in the plays. And then it turned out that Fitch was connected to this whole network of powerful people in New York theater as his career expanded that were also uh, people who we now would recover as queer, people who lived, lived with um, other men or other women uh, and worked together partly because they were comfortable with each other uh, as well as being very talented. So, um, Th those were my major pathways in into this line of research. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, um, re recovery, regeneration from Kimar's words make me think of um, playing hopscotch with the girls um, after school, being a, def a definitive moment, particularly with Black girls, being a definitive moment of of queerness being harbored in in a fem in a black feminist ecology, and so when I'm thinking about this game, these are one of the only games where you're watching simultaneous like kinesthesia. You're watching a game as you're playing, and everyone has roles, and it's in an ecosystem developed on a pavement where you would like less likely to see something beautiful pop up all of a sudden. There's a women's organized game happening that has rules and structures, and in some ways harboring me um, as one of the guests in this game. At that point, I'm not a gay boy, but I have um, affects and ways of being and ways of comportment that would align with them and their mannerisms. Um, and I call her, her name is Keisha, a girl who lived down the street. And she said to me, we, we see you, we know who you are, um, but are you going to play? And, and that, that line for me really was like, I know that you're something that you're somehow different, but the question is, is did you come to play or not? Um, and this sense of play really resounds both in how I think about it as a genderqueer male, how I'm thinking about my relation to women, and also my relationship to queer history is also being about the bodies, about bodies in space and time, bodies moving through space and time, and regenerative in the sense of, because of, particularly from Africanists um, through the transatlantic slave trade, lots have been lost, even the histories of queer, queerness through, through from particular regions have been lost through Africa coming here. And so going back through the body, finding things that are call and response, finding that are polycentric and polyrhythmic and, and searching for the Africanist tendencies in queerness. Regeneration seems to be one of those things where looking back and re re reordering the telling um, as truthful, but still re and reordering of the telling to say, ah, there was, there was queerness even there. Um, my second sort of formal in graduate school is um, I ran across this book called Christ's um, Outrageous Rebellion. And it talks about um, God being both fully, Christ being both fully man, fully God. And I thought that's the queerest shit I've ever heard. Um, and then I'm like, oh, so this is a, God's a prototype for transness. Of course, this has always been here. Um, a, a, a being walking around, being two things simultaneously or understanding or breaking down dualities. This has a queer prototype to it, and everything else becomes queer uh, that surrounds this this figure, this this historical figure, um, spiritual figure, depending on how you're looking at it, maybe. Uh, uh, which is also a regeneration, recapturing of traditional 
Christianity, traditional Christianity and how it understands itself into this very beautiful queer family that is based not on biology, but based on some other kinds of connections. And so it starts to make me wonder about queerness as a spiritual practice in and of itself. So I think that's where I ended up uh, coming to. Thanks. Um, and I think I think for me, it's really important to note how long I avoided finding an entrance to queer history. Um, I spent so much of my young undergraduate and early graduate career um, as a very open and out trans person, like refuting anyone who assumed like, oh, so you must be in gender studies. Um, that was always the assumption. And I think I was often for a long time, I mean, because this was as early as like 12 years ago. Uh, the first trans person a lot of people met. So it just came with all these assumptions in this academic context that you must be doing gender studies, you must be studying queer history if you're a historian, because I was a, a undergrad history major. And I was just like, no, like I live it. Like, I don't want to study this. I was very, very resistant. Um, but I think what I felt like in, at the time as resistance was also the reality now that I look um, that queerness felt like it was only contemporary. Queerness only felt like it was possible and present and maybe had that futurity, um, but it certainly didn't have a history. And I think as a young trans person, when I did kind of take a women's and gender studies class, or um, I know I took like LGBTQ history courses in undergrad, it always felt gay and lesbian. Like, I just did not see myself and my experience in what was even being offered as queer history to me. Um, so it always felt something I was like adjacent to, but unwilling to fully do. I was doing other history. I was like, no, I, I have an African and Black diaspora studies double major. I'm in a critical ethnic studies grad program. I don't do queer history. Um, my queerness and transness, again, informed how I sh was showing up academically for other communities as a white trans and queer person. Um, but this temporal aspect, I think I've I've started to think a lot about um, more recently of just like, why did it feel like to me, a historian and now a trained archivist, that like queer history was very impossible um, and that like you, you just couldn't do that type of investigation. Um, and there was no way that I could see reflections, both of myself, but the people around me um, in the archives or in capital H history. Um, and I think it didn't help that a lot of my academic, um, not essentially mentors, but the people in power with what I could kind of write and research, even as an undergraduate uh, and young graduate student, like also didn't see queer history as possible. Like that was such a message that I received from my discipline um, for so long um, or that like you didn't have the capacity to do queer history yet because you needed queer theory um, and you couldn't bring in theory if you're just an undergraduate learning how to do history like that. That's a you got to wait till you're in grad school. Um, and so I think for a long time, I just didn't know I could, but I also didn't want everyone to assume that that's what I was doing like those things were both in uh, as a barrier, served as a barrier to me really entering uh, into queer history. And so I think my pathway like came at a much later date in some sense. Um, I was already on my academic path and I moved to Iowa. Um, and as someone who had been a much more urban um, living person before I came to even just to Iowa City, um, what happened when I moved to Iowa City was my queer community that I took for granted, I think in like Chicago and Milwaukee disappeared. Um, and it wasn't readily available to me anymore as a graduate student. Um, and that was something that was like life altering for me. And it was like, well, why, why don't we have queer spaces? Um, why don't we have ways to gather and know each other in the present? Um, but also like, why do queer people kind of feel invisible in Iowa? This can't be true. Um, and so that was what really pushed me to start doing the local history work and then found a queer community archives here in, in Iowa, you know, four, four years later, uh, being in town was because all of a sudden to not have queerness as a contemporary community made me look backwards. 
like it shifted and it's not anything that I'm trained in. Like I don't have a cert even a certificate in gender studies. I like, this is not my field technically in terms of academic training, but I can use those skills that I have as a historian and an archivist um, from different contexts to do this work and immerse myself at this really hyper local level. So yeah, I'll pause there. Incredible. Thank you, Aiden. Um, I, I feel like we're, uh, touching on this kind of critical moment of going from accidental learning to intentional learning and how that is still a quest. It is still on the shoulders of the learner rather than being taught or being given, you know, um, stumbling into teachers and mentors quite often. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to speak on that and how, you know, art or performance or, or, or any sort of media intersects and, and troubles that as well. Well, thinking about what Aiden was just saying, I mean, I guess I was never burdened by kind of doctrinaire history training with a capital H because I was coming from theater and, and, and theater history and American studies. Um, so I actually, I went from an undergrad major in drama to uh, an MA in American studies and then into uh, a PhD specializing in um, US theater history. So the American studies training uh, is, is deeply interdisciplinary and it inculcates an ethic of, um, uh, going after what you need to answer the research questions that you have. Um, so uh, the going after what I needed to find out about Clyde Fitch and other things I, I was working on, um, you know, took me right, right into <laughs> a queer historical in, investigation. And I, you know, th this was in the the eighties. Um, so I didn't, I didn't have to navigate the kind of uh, disciplinary barriers that, that you apparently felt Aiden, um, you know, and in the course of my career, you know, I, I'm sometimes not viewed as a quote unquote real historian. <laughs> Be, because of that, but of course, I would argue differently. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, Anne, to your point about um, you know stumbling onto mentors and so on, I mean, there's still there is a great deal of coincidence. On the other hand, people who have common interests tend to meet each other or or get referred by someone else. They're they're talking to and you know that's of course what's what's wonderful about be, being at a university especially a big uh research university um and again coming out of that interdisciplinary american studies and to that i would add performance studies uh which i sort of acquired performance studies was not something that was taught in my doctoral program, but it was something that was rapidly emerging in those years that I um, began to embrace as, as a professor. Um, so, so thank you. Um, I think for me, my, um, I also didn't feel the same sorts of um, barriers. I think that Aiden may be pointing to, but I, I found that my trajectory has been more like just change, just get another degree in a different subject. Uh, seemed to be how I dealt with the interdisciplinarity. Performance studies being a general, the general house under which I think I'm working in. Um, but I think there's a sense in which, when I felt like I had exhausted what a what a terminal degree in dance could offer me. I just changed over to find another degree that could offer me something else and thought maybe that my body is the intersection um, or that I am the intersection. But now I think more about communities of citation and who I'd invite, who invite into the theoretical or practice dinner party. Um, and in my community of citation, it could be varied 
um, very people could be coming in and talking and being witness to what to the theoretical or practical experiments I'm I'm, I'm engaging with. And then the the second piece of that I think is um, fields can claim you later um, and your work later as it already comes around. So at this moment, I could say, wow, there's a great archivist who's doing, who might be doing kinds of practices that would be considered uh, primary research in gender and gender sexuality studies. And this is, you know, that would be a, a way that I think fields could turn around and absorb you, even if you didn't even intend for them to. Um, so I'm interested also in like, sort of rereading of um, the after the fact. You were always a part of the thing. You just didn't know you were yet. Um, perhaps, um, which seems to in line with like Jose Munoz's sort of queerness is always on the horizon. It's, we never get there quite yet. It's just before us, somehow prophetic in its possibilities. Um, so yeah, so that's where I am, I think. I agree. And I think like that idea of the Munozian kind of like always becoming, always on the horizon, right? On this con this kind of concept that Anne mentioned about like stumbling into things. I mean, it really belies a sense of like a solid expertise because like I'm constantly learning about myself. Like there was dialogue in the play last night that that the Anne's play last night that I was like, oh, that was that conversation I had in seventh grade, you know? Like, it's just a kind of like this unfold, this constant unfolding that helps me actually be uncomfortable with not being an expert in something and allows me like the promiscuity I need to kind of be wide in my breadth and interest, um, which is probably why so many of us on this panel are super interdisciplinary, right? And like willing to do that that kind of work. And I, and I, I think that maybe now I'm having... I'm having a theory now that queer theory was invented in order to, which I, I teach queer theories. So this is really like throwing myself under the bus to, to like give an expertise in something, right? <laughs> like, why is it so opaque? Like, why is it so difficult, right? Uh, so that people can feel like they have a sense of expertise, right? Cause it's just, but this stumbling thing is, it's actually really, it's really wonderful. It's a great way to go about trying to learn about the world um, through that and kind of not feeling like I have a sense of expertise in anything. Um, and yeah, and seeing what happens, what happens on the horizon, right? And kind of having that eye towards that, that sense of fraternity. Yeah, I love how you put that, Liz, of this kind of constant curiosity that we are afforded. Um, Aiden, were you gonna jump in? Oh yeah, I was just gonna say like, in thinking about, in envisioning a queer future that might look different than um, how it sounds like it has been for some of us. Obviously, you always have to find yourself first um, and start to unravel yourself, uh, whether that is through reading a book or stepping in an archive or talking to someone or seeing some type of a play or um, a movie that like hits you and you go, oh, okay, <laughs> starting to unpack what's going on. Um, I think that's a necessary first step and that will never um, disappear from uh, queer and trans lives. Um, that moment of discovery and, and, and the beginning of being able to unravel the self and make meaning. Um, but like what I think the mission of somewhere like the LGBTQ Iowa archives um, and library and other queer community archives is to like put out more invitations, right? So there, it's not just you having to stumble alone um, or having less opportunities to stumble into queer history and stumble into yourself. Um, but I think like, even if you stumble into it, like for me, it was really hard only seeing gay and lesbian history for such a long time. It felt like when I, when I had access, um, I think in somewhere like Iowa, like people only see San Francisco and New York, right? Maybe they see Chicago, maybe they see Philadelphia, maybe they see DC because of the marches on Washington. And so it's like, how can a queer community archives in a state like Iowa make more invitations for queer youth and trans youth to find themselves and find their history maybe earlier? Like what kind of public work can we do um, that makes the history familiar, right? Because then it's local and it's like, oh, I know Iowa City or I know that person or, oh, I'm from Sioux City, I didn't know. And like, we're talking to an archival donor in Spencer, Iowa. How amazing would it be able to tell the story of a gay man in Spencer, Iowa, right? Like how beautiful to invite people who are in the community in this current political and cultural moment um, to learn that history. And so I think uh, in terms of futurity, like it, the future is very exciting. 
um, as we learn and share more queer and trans history, um, I think the way to go is hyperlocal. Um, and that's always my bias as a local historian. Um, but I think that's a way to, to really make, make more invitations, um, I think is the biggest way I think about it. Because we won't always educate everyone. We won't be accessible everywhere. Um, I think it's a long battle to get into school curriculum, having seen it for other communities, um, especially in a state like Iowa. And so I don't think um, that's anything immediate, but how many ways can we, can we create more invitations in our state? It, wow, thanks for that. Um, I, I, I guess I wonder if, if a part of it is that um, of the looking and the desire, both the orientation towards desire to want to find ourselves has something to do with um, the change of language or the mastery of language. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, what people used to describe what might be considered now trans experience might not be using those same words, right? So how, how, how can the searching or the looking um, or the desire or the orientation towards something um, uh, look, look for its constellations, uh, co uh, con the, the constellations of things around it that might produce a kind of sense of self, even if the language itself doesn't, the language wasn't in use. So like um, trans person might not have been the time used 20 years ago, but what, what, what categories, what, what ways of being, what effects of the body, the body and present would have le lend itself towards a, a more of a trans experience. And maybe there might, might be what we're searching for. Um, at the limits of what language actually can do in its naming and power structures, and in a, what what else is around it. Um, and for me, I find uh, I, I imagine I do queer theory too, but I think I do queer material materialism, where I'm I'm searching for what the body is in the thing. Given my predisposition, my my predisposition to movement, I'm searching about, about migration, where bodies are moving from place to place, where things are changing because of bodies and space and time. Um, I, yeah, I, I wonder how to find family or to find how to find kindred spirits of people in our houses who, um, to use a sort of New York ball term, people in our houses who who we may not readily recognize, but who who have been there um, somehow already. Yeah, that was beautiful, Aiden. Thank you for that. Something that um, came up within that too is the kind of way in which the archive. Um, has this relationship with creativity and with art that is so necessary, um, especially within the kind of scholarship. And I'm thinking a lot of like fabulation and City of Hartman's work, right? But this kind of way about like looking so much of looking at something like, uh, especially even thinking about trans history and thinking of J Jules Gills Peterson's work and like kind of looking into medical archives, right? A lot of times looking into this kind of void or, or oblivion um, and trying to say like, okay, I have to also in some ways deal with these gaps, these absences, these silences. And this is where I see this like beautiful, like the kind of the culture, the arts, the, the creativity and the fabulation step in at that moment um, to imagine a past, um, you know, which we saw a lot in, in, in the play and, and, and in all kinds of different ways of, of cre getting creative uh, with, with history and with an interpretation of history through that. Yeah, I think this is a, a great spot to jump in and say when I when I left Anne's uh, beautiful play last night uh, in the car ride on the way home, I said to my partner verbatim, uh, the archives can't do that shit, <laughs> but you can't do that shit without the archives it was like the the archives can't make meaning like that. They can't give you that affected like, yeah, you can have really affective moments as a researcher. I've had those where I find something or someone I'm looking for, of course, but that's so individual. And that type of storytelling and meaning making um, that is archival, right? I'm like, love Anne for being someone who does so much historical research and is so fueled by queer history in her, her writing. Um, like, but you can't, as an archivist, like the documents in an archive aren't gonna do what England's Splendid Daughters just did. Like, and that's where I just, you know, I, I know we have, I don't know, a landscape where we wanna keep the humanities and academia alive and things are under threat, uh, perhaps in different ways. But like, 
I just want to keep finding more opportunities to invite creative use of the archives. Um, and I love like at work, trying to work with performance classes and creative writing classes and other types that aren't just your history um, or English or American studies, perhaps as some of your more arguably traditional disciplines, but inviting in performance and art. Um, and I want to do that in the community archives because that is how we get um, storytelling uh, to be really affective, but also more invitations, right? Someone is going to be more likely to go see a play than they are maybe to read a piece of queer scholarship. And I think we all can admit that sometimes that's not the way that a lot of people are going to enter. Um, and so I do see the arts as a, a critical site for queer history and a way to invite people into the archive um, to make meaning of it. And we need to rely on uh, brilliant minds like Anne Crichton's. Indeed. Uh, that was beautifully said, Aiden. And one of the moments in the play that just really uh, was amazing in terms of what, what performance can do to bring the archive forward was the moment where the, um, and forgive me, I, I can't remember the actor's name, but just, uh, very much sort of a gentleman Jack type who, who took the knife and sliced open the skirt to create the trousers. And in that sequence, uh, one of the other women said, um, what, what are you doing? What are you? Because in that movement, uh, the, the gender that was already being deeply troubled by the whole situation um, literally ripped ripped open and something else was able to be created in front of our eyes. And then of course, some of the other characters did that subsequently, but uh, that, that was just breathtaking. How um, uh, the, the conventions of the theater and impersonation can, can truly bring about transformation. And yes, this is taking place in the period of World War I, but how many, how many of us still go through those points in our lives when we do things like that? When, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I remember when I cut my hair off, uh, when I just ditched all of the dresses and things that I had been forced to wear. And, you know, it allowed... <laughs> It allowed a, a new way of being to come forward. And I think um, uh, people still go through that uh, now in various ways. Um, so thank you for that. And that was just one moment I wanted to bring out because it, it just, it took my breath away. Uh, how she did it, you know, with a big knife. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And the sound. And, you know, I don't know if um, you had to have a bunch of those skirts uh, for the run of the show or if they were sewn up in between or how, how you pulled that off. Do tell. Were, were, they, were they cutting new skirts? No, uh, our, we had a very nice budget for the show, but not a new skirt every night budget. Um, I will let you know the theater magic later <laughs> how we engineered that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think this brings us around also to um, what I wanted to call back to of body as an archive. And, and in, uh, I think a lot of what is value as we identify as valuable about learning queer history is learning these community knowledges and bodily knowledges um, to help us navigate our own present. So something I'm thinking about is, do we need language to communicate history? Is that too troublesome? Is that part of it? Um, what role do objects have in, you know, archives is, you know, so amazing to go through and find old posters and old photographs and old love letters. And um, the, um, that um, physical history is so fascinating to me as well. So I'm curious, um, about what is important when we are, are teaching or sharing history. I, I think, um, thanks for that I, question. I, I think something that's important about the archive is 
Like, I think there are multiple archives to start off with is that, yeah, I think the body has an archival process. We want to pass on through blood memory, through kinship memory, definitely um, through what I would call like repertory practices, repertoire practices. Um, they, they, they aren't done in isolation often. Often they're done off of pieces of knowledge or um, not full knowledges. And so when I'm teaching or when I'm thinking about it pedagogically, what I'm often asking is what, what are the other cooperators or other witnesses to the story you're trying to tell? Um, how does the archive witness what you're doing? Um, does it believe in this constellation? Is, how do the elders that you're speaking to witness what you're doing um, as a performance maker? And if, and if you can get witnesses to say, yeah, they, 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 tend, they tend to witness what you're saying or can put forward what you're saying, um, I don't want to say a definitive truth, but it might be closer to circling around what happened um, historically. Um, and so, a, so to be ahistoric doesn't seem to be um, as useful in, in storytelling uh, as, as, as leaning on what's, what's present, objects, materials, um, letters, what's been left behind, res the, the residues of people's lives um, that we might be enacting and bringing forward, um, while also bringing forward our own lives simultaneously. Um, and new queer futures can't somehow for me can't exist without some knowledge of a queer past, um, whatever that queerness, whatever that queer past may be. There, there's something so powerful about encountering an object that has been used by predecessors in a history that you're finding yourself in. Um, among the most salient objects for me that have sparked my own historiography uh, are leather. Uh, in in particular, um, leather horse equipment, you know, that's that's old and used because it literally takes the, the rubbings of the bodies <laughs> of of both species who who did that work, and in that in that interaction um, made the the human bodies uh, they had to merge with the horse's body and thereby queered humanness itself as as a category and um, the the class system and the social structure that that was going on around horses was also um, very dynamic as people moved up and down and in and out um, depending on uh, what what use they were making of the horses and where they were coming from um, so I myself personally come from a horsey family, as you might have guessed, and, and these objects are objects that I've grown up with. Um, for instance, when my mother died, I acquired her saddle. Talk about a loaded, uh, <laughs> a loaded piece of leather. Um, and, you know, when you ride, you sweat, and, and the, the way the leather is rubbed is from her legs and mine on top of it. Um, so th this, this uh, recognizing that, coming in contact with it, sharing it with other people uh, opens up a way to access the past that folks might not have thought of. I had this experience many times when I did the exhibit in the library gallery that was trying to bring a national history of, of people and horses into an Iowa City uh, context. And we had actual leather objects. We invited people to, to handle them who came through the exhibit and told some of these stories about where these objects came from and who had used them so that people were actually touching the harness, you know, that the, the had, pulled, uh, had pulled the carriage. And this just opened up conversations. It, it made people think about their own family paths and, and what those type of interactions meant. So I think um, finding a way to bring those archives out, not only onto the stage as you did, Anne, but into uh, classrooms 
and uh, gallery type settings where uh, the, the folks who come in can actually handle, handle the objects. So I, I think that's a very rich educational activity. Oh, Aiden, were you going to jump in? I was just going to say the, the archivist in me for everyone who's here and on the panel is just like, donate your objects, please. Um, I know sometimes archivists can be a little frustrated because, you know, the specificity of objects and preservation and storage is more complex than documents and we need to order the right things that fit you know, fit to size for the specific object and have a conservation plan. Um, but I think some of those really affective moments in an archive can't happen if all we have is paper. Um, and I think a lot of people think, oh, archives, paper, Hollinger boxes, you know, there's folders and you look at them. If you, if you do have that visual of archives or you've done um, research in a more traditional archival context. Um, so donate your material goods. I think like in researching queer community archives, one of the most affective moments I've ever had was opening a box and finding a trucker hat inside it that Joe Gregg from the Gerber Hart Library and Archives in Chicago had worn. He was one of their librarians um, who had succumbed to AIDS um, and is, has been certainly a role model in studying his work um, as a, a young kind of burgeoning community archivist. Um, and finding his hat just like made me stop in the archive and pause. Like it was such an emotional, like I'm getting emotional right now just thinking about it. This is like, here is something I've seen a photograph of Joe in this hat. Um, and now I'm holding this hat and like it was just like it pulls you to that present or to that connection um, that even when we lose our elders and those generations, we can still kind of feel each other and see each other through the archive. Um, and so I think archives are so much more than paper. Um, and that's especially true, I think, most traditionally for performance and art um, archives. Um, but I think even for something that would be more traditionally a kind of paper record um, how can we get more physical material and objects um, beyond the paper to really humanize that archival experience? Great, thank you, Aiden. Um, I just wanna remind any folks uh, who would like to, um, please feel free to submit any questions through the Q&A or through the chat. Um, we would love to hear from you. Um, with our collaboration with the Pride Alliance Center, we had, um, some students um, from that organization submit some questions. And one of them, one question that pertains to what we've touched on a bit here is, how do we educate others while also being learners ourselves? Of course you can't educate till you learn, but you know. <laughs> I just wanna take a moment, and this is like, it's not a really direct answer to that, but I feel, like I'm always on this really sharp learning curve for trying to understand Gen Z and my students and like how they interpret LGBTQ life and like their sense of queerness, um, which is very different in just discourse and vocabulary uh, than mine and what I, I grew up with. Um, and I find that like kind of having to continuously like intake media that's I mean I, I can really get stuck in this in like the 60s and 70s right from my work um and be really immersed in that right and then to kind of have to like switch over between like that era that period the vocabulary from that period and then also trying to like take in media where I'm like learning about how young people like express themselves and and talk to each other and talk about their their community with a completely different vocabulary um it's an enriching experience it can sometimes feel like overwhelming um as well so that's uh something that i'm like very conscious of um in in my in my own work and as someone who like teaches this material I think I have been in different ways as well, uh, Liz. And you know, when you when you're bringing embodied archival encounters into a learning situation, you're you're sparking conversations where the 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 students um, who you're trying to uh, 
bring the information to are responding and often uh, in in ways that you know I I'd never thought of this this happened to me so many times uh, dealing with th this exhibit that I mentioned before that had you know a hundred and some objects in it and you know I might ask Anne who who you've just been through this incredible uh, archi embodied archival encounter in creating this show and while you you knew a great deal about it researching and writing the play I'm sure that there was layers of additional learning that went on in the course of collaborating with the other folks working on the show through these archival engagements that that opened your own expanded your own knowledge about what it was you were you were trying to do so do you want to speak to any of that sure um the first thing that comes to mind is really uh the difference in specificity of age. Um, I'm, you know, as you can tell from the streamers in the background, I'm turning 31. <laughs> um, but the majority of my cast are undergrads and very young grad students. You know, we range from nine, from 18 to 23 in the cast. And just those like micro generations of queerness um, and life experience has been fascinating because I, you know, I wrote these characters who are those ages. They're all very young women who um, went into uh, the volunteer aid detachment and participated in this, you know, incredible and incredibly intense experience while also trying to figure out who they are at the same time. Um, so I would say my cast really taught me a lot about, um, the 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 clumsiness of being that age and and trying to um understand your body for the first time um a lot of that play is about understanding your power for women who had never participated in the world or participated in their own body um, in that way. So that was definitely a learning experience. Whereas, you know, I had done a lot of the research. I brought a lot of like, oh, this is what I found in the memoirs. This is what they said it was like. And then I imagined up the rest of it in a very sort of fan fiction sort of way. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely it was a kind of a continual unfolding of how do we tell the story? What is accurate? What is important for people to understand was true versus how can we communicate how it felt to be there? And um, just, I just want to jump in on that because um, another motif, a physical motif that went through the production was the, the, the handling of the bodies. Um, obviously this is World War I. There's also, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of casualties. And, and that was brought into the production in, in a very artful way. But that, that um, those sequences also called to mind other situations, not only World War I, but, you know, harken back to the Civil War or forward to the Second World War. Uh, and it also since this was a queer context, it, it put me in mind of the AIDS epidemic and women, lesbians in particular, um, cradling <laughs> the bodies of the sick men, the, the sick and dying men. Um, so that's another way in which uh, that the staging of the archive, it what resounds through it and what it puts people in touch with is moves through different histories in the moment. Um, so that was very powerful. I, I don't know if that came into your mind specifically as you were creating those sequences, that those, those resonances across time, um, but it, it was very affective that way. Thank you, Cam. I would love to shout out uh, my choreographer, Michael Landis from the uh, Department of Dance, whose brilliant work um, staged those sequences. Um, 
Well, uh, I also want to touch on before we wrap up here, um, from your own work, I'm wondering what impact you have impact you've observed or feedback you've received about um, your work in relation to queer history? How, like, what impact has it made on people? What have people learned or, or grown from it? Any, any, um, anything you've been gifted back from what you've put out uh, into the world? I can speak quickly to that just because it actually relates to the other question you asked too about like being a learner. Um, I just found like when I taught my queer performances class uh, last semester which Michael was a student in um I you know here's the here's some material like similar to what you're saying like here's some material here's some you know knowledge here's a couple of monographs and books and everything and just what came back from students from their projects like this kind of collection of of diving into different mo- it was inc- it was really incredible to get that kind of like you took an idea and you just ran with it Right. And being able to take ideas that were coming up in class and just apply them uh, across time and within oneself. And it was it was a really incredible experience and showed me that kind of what happens when these ideas get put in dialogue um, and how important it is to kind of continually having uh, spaces, whether that be like a seminar room, which is very highly formal and crafted, or whether it be like a more community space, which I would love to do more of that work in there, where that dialogue could just continue to take us into farther spaces. And how queer is that, right? We we take an idea, we, we see a haircut, and then we say, yeah, put it on me, see what I can do about that. I spent most of my career as primarily a scholar who, um, you know, was on the uh, the audience side of the footlights and writing scholarly articles, you know, and books, many of them about queer theater history. And it wasn't until I crossed the footlights myself and started using embodied performance as a form of investigation that I I experienced the immediacy of audience engagement and response to a mode of presenting scholarship that, you know, people who make performances uh, experience. Um, And and that that was new to me because because of the kind of work I had always done and I was shifting, uh, shifting genres. But what a, a huge thing I learned from that is is the importance of bringing your whole self to the work, and to the extent that you bring your whole self to the work, people will take away from it more. Um, so you know, as scholars, we're trained to uh, at least <laughs> back in my generation, you know, you you didn't use the pronoun I. It was in the third person. You didn't talk about personal material, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but when you do queer theater history, uh, you you need to you need to put yourself in there. I I think it's vital to talk about the position that you're writing from. You know, I think this has been one of the huge transformations of of historiography in in the span of my career. Um, But still, when you're writing a book, even if you're a wonderful writer and a good storyteller, it's not the same as when you're there physically present and what's coming across is not only your words and your intellectual ideas, but your emotions. I, you know, what, what's at stake for you in, in presenting this material and the kind of vulnerability that, that's opened up by doing that. So, uh, you know, Chris, <laughs> as a dancer, uh, you must have, um, 
uh, deep wells of experience along these lines. But, but for me, you know, that was something I sort of stumbled into in the course of trying to answer certain research questions. But that, that was a big lesson, bringing, bringing your whole self to the work and recognizing the emotional wells of knowledge and the knowledge we carry in our bodies as, as well as our intellectual knowledge from the archive. Uh, and, and, from, and, and right from that moment, I think being and knowing are vastly different concepts, like a sense of um, knowing about something and, and being um, in a more like Africanist sense is a sense of like, uh, to, to do a quick connection, I think when I think of the civil rights era or the, or the protest practices at the Woolworths lunch counter, you know more about protest practices if you actually have to go out in real time and be in an intersection of something and present the body as a, as a part of risk. And now we're talking about uh, archival knowledge that's living in the body and that's put right up against each other. And then you can talk to me about some sort of experience of protest from that from that ang from that triangulation, and it's it's the embodied inquiry too that needs an art again like needs an archiving that is stands on its own as a kind of performance way of holding it, but then somehow relies and relies again back on some archive and and a, and a different way of acquiring knowledge that that doesn't assume it's, it's linear and doesn't assume that it doesn't have circles and ways of coming and emerging um, from practice, uh, which is what I, I think for me, it's, a deep, it's from a deep, I guess, a, hopefully a deep well of like embodied experience that turns towards a, a theoretical premise and says, well, how do I understand this? Whereas I see others, even it feels like from panelists who are coming from a scholarly experience, turning into performance saying, well, how do I see this? Um, I think there, there are all sorts of middle grounds and ways that um, it's all incredibly embodied. Um, even the art of writing feels to me even more, even more to be just a, a, an embodied activity too. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I think. I think uh, for me, um, founding the community archives has been probably like the greatest result of any of my scholarly work and research. Um, I found myself uh, doing a community archives based dissertation and then found myself in a lot of queer community archives as oh an adjacent project I would deal with later and not exactly what my dissertation was about at the time boy how that's changed um but like it's really when I from my perspective of the work of creating um Lyle the acronym that we we call the community archives. Um, it's a it's obviously a place and a practice that is so about queer history, or at least that is the future goal in terms of the the materials we're collecting and the way we want to share out that knowledge. Um, but I think what maybe can kind of get lost, um, and that I've been trying to do some writing about and find a different type of like non scholarly venue to publish, um, is that it's also a work of or from queer history. Um, like I've been so informed by my research about what early queer community archives in the 1970s and 80s, um, kind of at the height of gay liberation, um, how they emerged. What did they do? What was their structure? Um, all of those questions that I studied, like what were their books? <laughs> how did they get books? Why did they have a library? How did that serve them if, if part of the mission was archival? Um, or, or a bulk of the mission was archival um, and scholarly. Like, why did this all matter and how did it come to be? Um, really informed the ways, at least early on, because now there's a lot of voices in Lyle, it's not just me, um, how it came to be and what it looked like and what were some of those early goals in year one. And that really informed um, the physicality of this space, my research. And so I think the impact that I've seen is a, it is uh, over a year later and it still exists <laughs> a year since it came into form. It's still here. People support it. Uh, we have, you know, I can like quantify it and that we have like 25 active volunteers who are very engaged in our work in a variety of ways. Um, and like what they say, the fact that they show up for this place and care for this place and tell us about how, how it makes them feel 
um, is the proof of the impact of this work. Um, and, and one of the things I think a lot about, which might be an aside, like we don't circulate a ton of, a ton of books as a library right now is an honest truth. If you look at our stats um, and I keep thinking about like, what is the power of a queer library that's unread? What does it mean that we have all these books in this space? Um, but that it still means something to people, even if they're not taking a book off the shelf and checking something out. Um, and it's that it's that physicality and legitimacy and familiarity of a library and of books um, that brings so much to us. So hearing people's responses to that um, really does feel like the pinnacle of my own work and this work in community and, and with lovely people like Ann Kreitman uh, to make this, this organization exist and this space come into being in the community. Um, and it's, it's just so clear, I think, from my earlier comment of like not feeling like I have this space when I came to Iowa City, um, that I'm not the only one. And the reason that it was so, it's been so viable um, is that people needed and wanted this type of space to bring us together. Um, and if I look at all of my relationships um, and the ways the people that surround me in my daily life have changed in this last year, the selfish answer is like, Lyle made me a community of friends. Um, but I think we all found each other and kind of fell in love with each other in this space and all care for each other in new ways that wholly weren't possible before this space existed. Um, so that is just like the, the ultimate marker of, I think, um, impact for this project. Um, but I never want people to kind of lose that idea that it's really a project of queer history that we've learned from this generational knowledge in the archives um, to create this space and to imagine it and know that it could exist here um, in Iowa. So. And that just makes total sense to me because like what the kind of exactly what you're doing by bringing the people, the, the bodies in the room, right, is you're also in the process of making the history that will one day be archived as well, because it's creating that sense of presence, because I mean, so much of, of queer history is people coming together in these rooms, right? And people coming together in certain rooms, whether that be like a, a bunk somewhere on the front, right? In France or um, in the kind of basement hangout, like library space in, in Iowa City, right? And so kind of doing that, like creating the, the living history, right? Within that of having, the just building community as being part of that. And and that makes me wonder too, given given what you're saying, Liz, about the the community building function of this archive. Um, so thinking about um, use policies that might be different from, say, special collections at the university. In, in other words, um, you know, how do you how do you mitigate that tension between wanting to preserve the material and yet it's so important for community building to put the letters in the hands of the 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 folks who want to come access the material. So how how would you differentiate your your policies in, in those ways? Kim, I'll just say we can talk about this for days. Um, I think about it a lot, but I think the greatest example and, and one of our like obvious role models and idols is the Lesbian History Archives in New York. Um, and like if that space, for those of you who have not entered it, I encourage you, if you ever find yourselves in Brooklyn, please go. Um, like is the embodiment of community trust in an archival context. They do not, police you in that space. There are no barriers really of like kind of how you can move about and what you can look at. No one has to pull material for you. You can go grab it yourselves. You can get a tour or not when you walk in the door and you can just wander and explore on your own. Um, and I'm sure it's crossed through the minds of many researchers and archivists who've been there like, wow, I could just take something and nobody would know. <laughs> Like, I definitely had that thought of like, there are 50 copies of this flyer in this folder. Would anybody know if I took one? Uh, I didn't take one. Like, and, and maybe things have wandered from the Lesbian History Archives, but I think there's so much reverence for our own history in community in that context, not in an institution, um, that it just like 
creates trust and care and a different type of ethos than what you are going to get and feel um, at work. Like when we pull out our 15th century medieval manuscript and we have to have kind of eyes on the researcher, right? And, and teach them handling practices and talk about like, please don't pick the book out, out of its cradle, right? Like this is part of my job. Um, and so that affective feeling in the space and how we engage the archives is so different. And I guess a short answer or a slightly long answer is some of it doesn't even need policy because there's just an ethos of care that is so different than um, people who aren't doing identity-based research or affinity work in, a, in an institution, or even as a queer person doing research in an institution, you maybe feel like you're being a lot more watched and policed because of the policies of entering an archive um, and what that can <laughs> allow you to do or like can you remove the paper clip that's rusty um can you pick up the box right there's a lot more question of how to move about a space in an institutional archive and I, and I hope that in a community archival context like Lyle um it's a clear invitation to pick up the material and kind of use it as you want and and that we trust our community to care for it just as much as we do there's something poetic about the kind of transition away from the white glove in the archive. Like when I started doing archival research, like I had to put these oversized white gloves on and it was really clunky. And then at some point that really changed. And I, you know, I asked, I was like, why I can use my hands to touch the materials. And they're like, yeah, we found out that the white gloves were actually responsible for more damage than they were protection because people weren't able to use their hands to touch the material. Our hands are made to handle the materials that they're supposed to. Right, um, and so that taking that metaphorically for really like the removal of, of that kind of white glove attitude towards the past, right? And understanding that the tools that we have that are part of our bodies are the best ones able to, to kind of do that, that work. Speaking of bringing our whole selves to the archives, uh, <laughs> ungloved and uh, vulnerable. That was so beautiful. Thank you so all so much. Um, uh, we need to wrap up here, uh, but I just wanted to um, express my immense gratitude for bringing this incredible group together. Uh, what a what a rich conversation um, that I'll be thinking about for a long time. So thank you all so much. So we do the quiet Zoom clap, uh, customary of our time. <laughs> Not mute the clap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Too loud. Yay. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. So great to be with you all and Liz and Chris and Aiden. Thank you. What yeah. Thank you. All. Yeah. Thank you. Really nice to and see Carla, everyone. our captioner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, panelists. Thanks, attendees. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday.